Okay, so let me do this question, um, work through the geometry here in this geometric optics-ish <laughs> and uh, 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 go through the application. So I can see that because it's uh, going under, uh, going through these refractions that in order to answer this question, I'm going to be invoking Snell's law. So let me just write that down. Uh, I'm going to be using Snell's law at some point or law of uh, refraction. But, um, you know, physics being a field that names laws after people, let me just continue using that. Um, but, you know, if you don't want to use, uh, I don't know, <laughs> white male privileged <laughs> physicist name to use, then you could say law of refraction. But, you know, I, I think uh, whatever is the most succinct, um, unconfusing, non, not confusing way to refer to things, I think that's what I'm going to use. So I'll say Snell's law. Snell's law says it describes the kind of how the light rays bend as they go from one region to another region. It relates these two angles using their um, index of refraction of the medium. And the form that I prefer to use says this. Um, the index of refraction in one medium times angle of the light ray to the surface normal in that medium, sine of that angle, is equal to index of refraction in the medium that it's moving to times sine of theta 2. So, so we'll be using that. Let me read through the rest of the question and see what analysis I need to do. So it says, uh, calculate the amount of the rays displaced by glass, delta x as labeled here, given that the instant angle is, uh, oh, so they're giving us theta 1 and they are giving us a thickness of the thing. So let me just uh, sketch that. So they've given us um, this thickness here. Uh, let me just label that as a D, thickness D. Okay, um, let me just uh, start drawing some auxiliary figures with geometry, which is what this is. Um, a lot of times as you kind of extend the lines, through auxiliary figures, some of the shapes that help you answer questions will kind of come to your vision. So this is one thing that I'm seeing. So, you know, this is delta x is, is the separation. That's going to be the same delta x here. And I'm beginning to see right triangles. And as I see those right triangles, I'm realizing that, oh, if uh, I can use this right triangle, and I can also use this right triangle. And in these two right triangles, I have um, these uh, uh, these two legs, this leg, long leg, that matches with the right triangle associated with the undeflected light, which means this angle here must be theta 1. Um, take this, subtract out this shorter leg, which is associated with this theta 2 then that difference will give me delta x. So let me just label this, I don't know, leg, um, leg 1, leg 2, delta x will be leg 1 minus leg 2. Okay, now I continue to stare at the drawing. See, can I figure out leg 1 and leg 2? And this is where it's uh, useful that I have identified right triangles and that I remember trig functions as a reminder, something that you covered a while back. So, ka toa, uh, meaning uh, sine of some angle is uh, associated with opposite over the hypotenuse. Cosine of some angle is A for adjacent over the hypotenuse. And to, uh, uh, the tangent, tangent of the angle is opposite over the uh, adjacent. So you look at these uh, triangles and you figure, hmm, hypotenuse, I'm not given hypotenuse. It looks like that's going to be a lot of work to figure out. So the first two, two things I've drawn here, it's probably not easy to use because to use that involves hypotenuse and um, that looks like extra work. I'm looking at this figure that's given. 
And in reference to the angles in the problem, it looks like that's the adjacent side. So we are given the adjacent side here. And the side that we are trying to find out, that happens to be the opposite. So I think I can, uh, noticing these details, now I'm in a place where I can write down some equations that relate my unknown quantities with the known quantities. So let me sketch that over here. So I can write down an expression for L1. I can say, or let me do it this way, and let's go slow. Let me first write down expression that comes from Toa. Tangent of the angle, I'm going to be careful, angle theta 1, the large angle there, is equal to the opposite, that's going to be the side that I labeled as L1, divided by adjacent D. Good. Um, the other expression would be tangent of theta 2, is equal to L2 over D. This leg divided by adjacent. Okay. I can see with both of these expressions, it's relatively easy to solve them for the one unknown that I'm interested in. L1 is equal to D tangent theta 1. L2 is equal to D tangent theta 2. And given that my expression for delta x is equal to L1 minus L2. You can just write it out. It's uh, d tangent theta 1 minus d tangent theta 2. Depending on what you feel like, you can do a little factoring. d times tangent of theta 1 minus tangent of theta 2. And I think that's enough simplification. This is an expression where it feels like I have access to all the numbers. I can just plug it in into calculator. So let me do that. The calculator I'm using is all from alpha this time. So, um, so let me just type in D. Uh, my D is 1.5 centimeters. 1.5 centimeters. Okay. That's all I need to know about D. Um, the angles. Uh, theta 1 is 30 degrees. Oh, I don't know theta 2. Okay, I should have done that first, probably. So let me just pause a little bit here. I've been treating theta 2 like that's a known quantity. And I'm finding out, oh, I don't know theta 2. How do you find the theta 2? That's this expression here. Theta 2 comes from this refraction here. So I can solve Snell's law for theta 2 and get something I can plug in there. So theta 2 is equal to um, N1 divided by, or let me put it this way, um, it's going to be N1 divided by N2 times the sine of theta 1. Now, that's not the theta 2, that's the sine of theta 2. So you have to put this through arc sine. So that's arc sine of all of that. Plug that in here, then you can get that. And you know, nothing stops you from doing just uh, something like this. You know, they told you theta 1 is 30 degrees. So you could, um, here, uh, instead of doing that, you can calculate for theta 2. You know, arc sine of n1 over n2. Uh, n2 is, um, it's glass. I think I have to look up. Uh, well, the hints don't link me to it. Uh, all right, so you need to go to our textbook and know where to look up for index of refraction. I think it's going to be 1.5, It's but it's good to double check. Uh, and, you know, you might not have indexes of refraction memorized like I do. So <laughs> let me go to um, index of refraction. Uh, it's probably going to be here. Refraction... Um, or if it's not here, it might be in section one, talking about the speed of light, or propagation of light. So it might talk about light slowing down in matter. Ah, here's the index of refraction. Uh, glass would be crown glass is 1.52, flint glass is 1.66. Let me use 1.52. Yeah, I think that's close enough. So 1.52. So arc sine of air divided by 1.52 for glass times the sine of the angle 30 degrees so you could totally do this and get arc sine get an answer 19.2 degrees and use that in further calculation 
Um, so again, I keep repeating. Yes, you can totally do that. Work out what theta 2 is. 19.2 degrees. Finish the calculation. Good, that'll get to the correct answer. Let me uh, show you something, a technique that's sometimes useful. Uh, so it's not the quickest way to get the answer, especially in this question. But there might come a scenario where, um, you know, this expression um, or what it'll end up being um, something that looks like, you know, something that looks like this. So what you will be having um, to put into here, something that, looks like uh, tangent of arc sine of all that. This is a transcendental expression. It involves two special functions that are not algebraic. But here's the thing. This is a, a such a kind of a function that actually has an algebraic expression. And there's a way to get it. We call that method of getting that algebraic expression for that um, combination of stuff. Uh, I call that, or I was taught this as drawing the triangle. It's a way to get at that algebraic um, expression that's underneath this transcendental looking thing. So this is what it comes down to. When you have, um, so before coming to this, the expression you had was this. So let me put it this way. I'm going to erase all this. So the starting place you had was sine of theta 2 was equal to this, which means you can do this. You can draw a triangle with angle theta 2, and you can start to label properties of this triangle. So sine, as we talked about before, is opposite over hypotenuse. So this ratio that you are being given here you can interpret it as opposite over hypotenuse. Let me group this grouping as my opposite. So this is going to be my um, opposite side, n1 sine theta1. And let me put this denominator into hypotenuse, n2. There are different ways of dividing it up. They all, in the end, give the same expression. I'm just doing it this way to try to avoid some fractions. So with this right triangle, here's a beautiful thing. Once you know two of the sides, then you can completely determine the remaining side. Use Pythagorean theorem. You know, one that says that given a right triangle like this, ABC, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. Here, let's say you are trying to find A. Then solving for A, A is equal to C squared minus B squared, square rooted. So I can write that expression here. This is side of this leg, length of that leg is going to be uh, square of the hypotenuse, n2 squared minus square root of um, the square of the, the one the other leg, n1 squared sine squared theta 1 square rooted. So that's going to be the side of the leg. And once you've labeled all the sides of the triangle, this is uh, the tool that you have. Any other trick function that someone wants, like, uh, let's imagine someone wants the tangent of the angle instead of the sine of the angle. Then all you have to do is look it up in this uh, diagram that you have drawn. So I can look up that, okay, tangent of the angle, that's the opposite over the hypot or over the adjacent. So I just write out the opposite over the adjacent. So instead of having that transcendental expression, what I can have is, let me erase all this, for so here where we need to know the tangent of theta 2, I can say tangent of theta 2. Okay, let me refer to the triangle I've drawn. I can go opposite n1 sine theta 1 over the adjacent square root of n2 squared minus n1 squared sine squared theta 1. And in terms of um, my known quantities, this is an algebraic expression. I can plug it in there, so I can have an expression for delta x that's completely algebraic, and that will get me the correct answer. So let me uh, enter my enter the numbers into my calculator on that basis. Um, so let me do it here. So I'm going to just enter the entire expression all in one go. My delta x is going to be d, 1.5 centimeters, times tangent of the angle, I'm given that, 30 degrees, 
minus, and for tangent theta 2, I'm going to enter this expression, n1, which is 1, times uh, sine theta, sine of the 30 degrees, divide by square root of n2 squared, so that's going to be 1.52 squared, minus n1 squared, 1 squared, so sine, uh, sine of 30 degrees squared, square rooted, close the last parenthesis, so that's the entire expression for delta x. When I press enter, it'll give me an answer. It'll tell me how it interpreted my input. Looks right. And then, uh, wait, was there a square root? Yeah, yes, there's square root. And then it gives me 0 0.3435 centimeter. So let me type that in 0 0.3. I can round it to three sig figs. So let me say 0 0.344. 0 0.344 centimeter. Let's see if that's correct. Yep, that's correct. And one advantage of this method is it allows you to go from like a beginning to the end. So, you know, if you first worked out theta 2 and then went from there, this kind of limits your precision. So if I wanted, uh, you know, number with the four significant figures that with the method I used, I didn't lose any precision anywhere. I went from beginning to the end, no intermediate calculations. But working out theta two separately like this can limit your precision. So that would be one advantage. So I think that's the calculation question. And in part B, it's asking, um, considering this setup, how would the theta three be affected? So theta three here, how would that be affected if the second medium were not present? Okay, that's interesting. Um, so let me erase some of these uh, drawings so that they don't uh, clutter up the thing as I scroll down. I think I can actually get rid of all of them. And um, I will. I think that's a multiple choice question, so I will show the choices first and then to kind of talk over the correct choice and why that's correct. And you know, you have an infinite number of tries, so you could get the correct answer by just guessing, but you know, that one have helped you learn physics. So. <laughs> Okay, so you have all these choices. And the answer I have to tell you is the, choose the correct answer is to say that theta 3 would remain the same, that it doesn't change. And I guess the very first thing you start out with is, you know, the question is proposing some sort of change if the second medium were not present, okay? Um, as you are making the change, you are, so you're changing N2. As you are making the change, what are you keeping constant? And I would propose the most uh, natural thing to keep constant is uh, n1, n3, and theta1. And uh, your theta2 will obviously have to change as n2 changes. And uh, then the question boils down to, you know, n2 is changing, n1 and n3 are the same, theta1 is the same, how the theta3 might potentially be different. And... Um, this is uh, the reason why um, this uh, form of Snell's law is my favorite form of uh, Snell's law. Because um, consider this. So let me move some things around so that I have space to write stuff. So um, so you are dealing with a, a boundary between N2 and N3. So you might r write down this consideration of uh, Snell's law. You might say, okay, um, N2 sine theta 2 in this medium moving into third medium is equal to n3 times sine theta 3. And notice how this expression is identical to that expression. Nothing stops me from chaining these equalities together. Say this is equal to n3 sine theta 3. And once you have that, then what I hope you will realize is that nothing stops you or the transitive property permits you to say that this is equal to this last thing in the equality. You can just say n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n3 sine theta 3. So the angle theta 3 is completely determined by n1 and n3 and theta 1. The whatever is intervening, it doesn't matter. Uh, there, there are some conditions that you do have to be careful with. The main condition that you do need for the expressions I wrote down here to be true is one, um, you need this uh, theta to here to be the same theta to here. 
And for that to be true, this surface here and this surface here, they have to be parallel. If they are somehow not parallel, then the geometric relationships I was relying on wouldn't work. But if these are parallel surfaces, so this theta to here is the same theta to there, then yeah, you can chain the equalities. The angle at the very last outgoing, it only depends on the very first incoming. All the intermediate stuff doesn't matter. It might affect the delta x as you saw, but it doesn't affect the final outgoing angle. So, so yeah, that's this, this, this question. Um, if the calculation can take a little bit of time, especially if you don't, uh, you know, do the easier thing and just do something that takes more steps. <laughs> but I want you to do that and kind of do this demo. So, um, so yeah.